Welcome. As I said, this series is presented by the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation, and I am proud to be their program's director. I am Susan Grew, and I welcome you all here tonight. The foundation prides itself on supporting this fantastic library. Its mission is to be the cultural, informational, and educational heart of the city of Newport Beach. And that is our job as, as the foundation, is to support them and drive them to their mission. This lecture certainly fits that billing of being the um, cultural, educational, and informational series. But we can't do this without your help. Every program costs us money, and we get no funding from the city. So every dime that we get comes from either you, membership dues, our series sponsors, or grant money that we're able to get from, from private foundations or state or federal funding. So we ask you to help us to continue to support this library beca by becoming a foundation member tonight if you not, are not already a member of the foundation. And, and I see many familiar faces here, and I thank all of you that I know uh, who are members, and I thank you for your continuing support, and I encourage the rest of you to join their ranks. Uh, just a quick reminder, one of the privileges of membership is uh, discounts on all of our ticketed programs. And we have some fantastic programs. I've been talking to you all, some of you all in the audience tonight. Um, I talked to you two, and you talked about coming to David Frum last uh, two weeks ago. We have Dr. David Edelman coming this Friday night and Saturday. Um, so many wonderful things going on. Again, only done through, only, of it, only possible through you and your membership support and your sponsor support. So thank you. And we have foundation in um, membership applications in the back. I had my newsletter, but I gave it away to some new foundation members. Um, so know that we have our beautiful color newsletter in the back, and the foundation application is inside that, or you can also easily and quickly become a member by going on our, our website. When you, when you go back to revisit this lecture on videotape. Um, one other quick thing, thank you we would like to give is to the Kempler family. Dr. Ike and Ginny Kempler are sponsors of this series. And as many of you may know, we did lose Dr. Kempler uh, the, these last few, uh, two weeks ago, and we extend our heartfelt sympathy to his family for the loss of this generous and gentle soul. This series, with the help of the Kemplers, continues through May, and the next lecture will be held on March 26th, and it's going to be about cataracts, so I invite you all to join join us then, If you, um, and in addition to coming to some of our other programs that are coming up in March. First, before we get to the cataract surgeons, I would am pleased to introduce tonight's lecturer, Dr. Arvind Janab. As the Director of Naturopathic Medicine at the Susan Samueli Center for Integrative Medicine, Dr. Janab is inspired by traditional wisdom and intrigued by the human condition. He is a naturopathic doctor with an eye on the new medicine that is all around us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Janab. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, so as uh, many of you have heard, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I've been with the Samueli Center for just over two years now. I'm happy to be here today to talk about a topic that's really close to my heart, um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I chose this topic to share with you, and hopefully it's of interest to you. Um, before I explain that or go into that, um, I'll just share a quick story about what I thought when Susan first uh, approached me to give this talk, she said, you know, we'd like for you to give a talk at the library. And it reminded me of talks I gave when I was first starting my practice in Toronto, Canada, which is where I'm from. And uh, lectures in libraries consisted of us sitting in a circle on kids' chairs. <laughs> and uh, so I was really surprised to come here today to find such a crowd and such a great facility. So thank you for being here. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm glad I dressed for the occasion. Yeah. So. Uh, I chose this topic, Love the Liver, um, Heal the Gut, 
Mostly because this is one of the first things I learned when I was a naturopathic student. So when I was a student back in Toronto, that was about 21 years ago now, I had an instructor who said these words to me. So, so it's not my title, it's his title. And he said, love the liver, heal the gut. That's really the secret to health. And I, I think we can extend that to say that this is a secret for healthy aging. And uh, hopefully after tonight, you'll have a really good appreciation for what the liver's role is in your health, but also what the gut's health is and why these two organs are so important and how they relate to one another. How many of you have uh, heard of integrative medicine in this room? Yeah, what about naturopathic medicine? Okay, great. Um, if you have questions about what it is, we can talk afterwards, so please come up to me. I'm happy to answer questions about what it is we do at the center, how we differ from some of the varying um, practitioners and providers that we have at our center. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about background information. I'd rather just dive in and talk to you about the liver, the gut, and some of the, the great things that will hopefully help us all stay young or age healthy. Um, so I'm going to skip the first two slides. Um, I'll say a quick word about our clinic. So at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute, we're a multidisciplinary clinic. There's a team of doctors that work closely together. Integra integrative medicine really supports that model of care, which is team-based, patient-centered. And we have a wide range of doctors. So as you can see here, we've got medical doctors, naturopathic doctors, osteopathic doctors, nutritionists, traditional Chinese medicine doctors. We don't have a chiropractor. We do have nurse practitioner and also doctors who are trained in functional medicine. So as you can see, it's a large team. We work closely together. We consult on cases together and approach patients from a very different perspective than what normal or regular medicine might approach. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, let's talk about what we'll talk about today. So we're talking about healthy aging. At least that's what I was told. I hope that's what you're here for. Um, and the first thing, you know, I was sitting and preparing my lecture, and I thought, well, aging is not really a disease, and I'm used to standing up and talking about illness. Um, the aging is a normal process. So really what we're talking about is something that's normal, it's natural, and what we want to speak to is what are some factors that affect or influence how we age, and what are some ways that we can age more gracefully and more healthy. So that's really important to remember, because a lot of what I'm going to share with you in terms of how we approach aging is really to in encourage healthy um, growth, healthy evolution. It's not to treat a disease or a condition. Um, we expect there to be changes as we age. There are normal physiological changes. Um, part of what we want to do is identify what those changes are, what the needs are for the individual, and then support those needs and support the organs that might need extra attention. Um, we know that many factors influence aging. Um, these could be anything from diet, lifestyle, our attitude, there can be other things such as genes and activity level. In all cases, our goal is to enhance organ function so that we can function at our full capacity as much as possible. Again, we don't set un, un, you know, unreasonable expectations, but we identify where can we make the most impact when we support patients who age. And the goal is to protect against various stressors, which uh, we know affect health, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on that. Um, the best strategy to ensure healthy aging is to decrease toxin burden, or toxic burden rather, optimize immune system, decrease inflammation in general, which we're finding is more involved in, in many conditions, and ensure optimal nutritional status. So are, do you have all the nutrients that your body requires in order to do some of the things that we want it to do? And the last one, which you hear a lot, is to decrease stress, because stress ultimately is the, the, the driving force behind aging. The more we stress, the more we age, and that's been shown clinically, but also in, in research, that our cellular age increases with increased stress. And then the last point which pertains to this lecture is that our digestive system and our liver play an important role in how we age. So let's talk about that. Before I go into that, let me just highlight one thing for you. So the spectrum of health to disease is, is a model, if you will, that integrative doctors apply when they're thinking about a patient or a person and how they evolve and go from wellness and optimal health and progress to develop various diseases. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is wellness and how to promote and maintain wellness and health, but pr probably most importantly right here, talking about dysfunction. 
and being able to identify this function before it becomes disease. And this is sort of the realm of an integrative doctor, is to say, how can I evaluate this person to see if there's functional changes that are taking place that will lead to disease? And then how can I correct those functional changes so that they don't develop disease and they can sort of move backwards towards that state of health or complete wellness? And a lot of how we do that is different um, modalities, if you will, different treatments, whether it's diet, lifestyle, herbal medicine, um, we've got emotional wellness and stress management, system support, which is really important, and we can talk about that a little bit further in the lecture, and then targeted nutritional therapy and herbal treatments, which are the nutraceuticals or the products that you see in your health food stores, which we use strategically to support certain systems and organs. All right, so what is aging? Um, we said it's the normal process. But to maintain or to support healthy aging, um, I would uh, sort of propose that it's a way of life. It's not really something you do. If you come to me and say you want a pill so that you can age healthy, um, I don't have that pill. If I did, we'd be having a different conversation. Um, but what it is, it's really promoting a way of life. It's a physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual um, way of life. It's being mindful. It's being active, both physically and mentally, keeping yourself stimulated. It's uh, having a sense of purpose with productive pursuits, mentally, spiritually stimulating. It's maintaining a healthy diet that's clean, that's nutrient rich, that's whole foods. It's low in empty calories, colorful and hypoglycemic. If you don't know what that means, it means you know, maintains your blood sugar regular. We're learning more and more that blood sugar dysregulation really sort of perpetuates the disease processes associated with aging. Um, to adopt a green philosophy, this is really taking the steps to ensure that your environment supports your philosophy, which in this case would mean avoiding chemicals, toxins, unnecessary medication, food additives and preservatives, avoiding alcohol in excess, and also coffee in excess. I'm guilty of that last one. Yeah. Um, and then get to know your genes. This is an area that's becoming really popular. It's, we're learning a lot more about genes. You know, 30, 40 years ago, the human genome promise to change medicine and what we're seeing now in the last few years is that it's changing medicine. So finally it's really caught up to how we practice medicine and we're seeing a lot more tools out there to support patients who've got genetic variances that we can find out by doing tests on genes. And these genes can, I'll, I'll speak to some of them with respect to liver and digestive health, but they can range from genes that support um, specific organs and systems, or they can be genes associated with detoxification of certain chemicals and toxins. <clears throat> Excuse me. Pick up the mic just a yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so what are some factors in aging? So really quick diagram. So you may have heard about telomere shortening. Telomere shortening has been directly associated with aging. We're going to, at our Women's Wellness Conference this year, the Susan Samuel Center is hosting the conference, and we're focusing on this. Our guest speaker is going to be speaking to this. Telomeres um, are essentially the caps that protect our DNA, and those, those caps can wear and tear. And really, that's all it is. As the DNA replicates, the caps wear and tear. With that wear and tear, what we see is decreased DNA function or resilience, and eventually the DNA and the cell dies, um, contributing to aging. There's the chronological factors, so just the fact that time passes, and with time passing, age happens, go figure. Um, there's oxidative stress, which is really important in our conversation today. We're going to speak about the liver, and the liver is especially involved in oxidative stress and oxidative load. So we'll speak about what this is and what it means and implicates for us. Um, I'm going to talk about some harmful medication surgeries and accidents that can contribute to aging as factors and the ability to repair cellular damage, which is also part of our oxidative stress model, but it's the repair side, if you will, or the repair component. Um, here's the telomere. If you want a little bit more, again, the slides will be posted for you. You can read this in detail. All, all I say here is that it's wear and tear of our DNA, but the lecture really doesn't focus on this, so we'll move on. And let's talk about this important relationship, the gut and the liver. So, how many of you know what the liver does in your body? Okay, it filters blood, right. Do you know how many functions the liver has? <clears throat> Take a guess, give me a number. 20, 20? okay. 
40, any others? 567? <laughs> Sold. <laughs> no, the liver has approximately 243 functions. Yeah, it has enzymes and uh, it, it's involved in 243 different biochemical pathways, if you will, that support health. So it's a very active organ. It's an extremely um, important organ because of its function in detoxification, but also for a number of other um, important metabolic functions that it serves. So let's look at this relationship really quickly, just to set the context. So here's our intestines, the gut, food, toxins, nutrients, medicines, everything that goes in, goes in one side, and then it's eliminated from the other side. As foods and toxins and nutrients enter the digestive system, they first go to the liver. This is an important design in our, human, in our body, if you will. The liver wants to ensure that anything that's coming in through our digestive system is being filtered, screened, and then, and only then, it's allowed to enter general circulation. This is how the liver protects us from toxins that might enter our digestive system. And once it clears it and it gives it the pass, nutrients, foods, will go on into the blood circulation to then support different tissue, different organs. What the liver doesn't allow pass through will then go towards the detoxification or metabolism pathways back into the bowels, usually via bile, the gallbladder, and then from there it moves out and you eliminate it. And that's an important function that our liver serves, which is to screen what our digestive system absorbs, take what's good, eliminate what's bad, and it just does that all day, all night, all your life. Now there are some, some instances where what's absorbed in the gut will bypass the liver and it'll enter circulation in our body. That's rare, but it does happen and we'll talk about some circumstances that cause or allow that to happen. What enters general circulation is not always pure, so we have to admit the liver is really good at what it does, but it still misses a few things. Some things get through the liver and then the body is designed to to withstand that, we've got our kidneys, our skin, as well as other organs which are involved in metabolizing or detoxifying some of the things that our liver does not metabolize or detoxify. A great example of this is when someone has some liver issues, whether it's health issues associated with liver or has digestive issues like constipation, we see an increased load on the liver and we see them urinate more frequently or have increased urgency with urination. And that's because the kidneys are trying to pick up the slack and help the liver detoxify. And in doing that, the urine becomes a little bit more, more of an irritant and the body is trying to get rid of it. And we see the same thing with skin. As the liver or the kidneys get overburdened, the skin tries to, to step in and, and, and detoxify and usually that's through sweat. So that's why sauna therapies are really important if someone has liver disease or kidney disease because that helps the, the skin play a bigger role to take some of that burden off kidneys and the liver. All right, and the lungs, I didn't put it in there, but the lungs also play an important role in this. We see this again in patients who've got liver issues that the lungs start to get more congested. They might cough up mucus. The mucus tends to be a little bit more gray, if you care for details. And, uh, <clears throat> and that's because some of that detoxification is happening through the lungs. Um, now what's important here, just in this bottom corner, is that everything that goes into general circulation eventually finds its way back to the liver. So if you've got someone who's got digestive issues, which is causing increased toxic burden on the liver, the toxins get into circulation, then they go right back and they go back into the liver, and this is what we call auto-intoxication. This means that we detoxify, put everything back into the circulation, and then everything returns back to the liver to get detoxified again. And that's like filtering bad air in your house with the windows closed. You just keep detoxifying the same toxins and eventually the liver and some of the other elimination organs just give up. They just can't keep doing this. They, we call it congestion or, um, or, um, or bur overburdened liver function. So that's, that's this relationship that the gut and the liver play. So let's, let's take each one and break it down into some more technical terms so that hopefully you can appreciate how important uh, this, this relationship is. So let's talk about the liver first. The functions of the liver. So I wasn't going to list 240 functions for you. I picked a few. Um, these are the most important ones, and you may not know that this is some of what the liver does. The liver is important in cholesterol synthesis, so that's very important. 
Um, it's important in glucose and glycogen um, cycling, if you will, so essentially sugar metabolism. A lot of patients or individuals who have blood sugar issues, it's actually their liver that's contributing to the blood sugar issues, not their pancreas. Um, the liver, as we mentioned already, deactivates poisons and detoxifies chemicals. It produces bile, and that's really important because bile serves two functions. One, it it's allows the liver to get rid of or eliminate toxins. But more importantly, it's, it's involved in fat metabolism. So the bile actually helps us metabolize and absorb fat-soluble nutrients, things like vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin A, and so on. And the liver is involved in protein metabolism, so amino acid synthesis. A lot of the proteins that our body utilizes for different metabolic functions, things like clotting factors, if you need to clot your blood if you're cut, um, uh, hormone binding proteins, which determine how your hormones function in your body, various hormones and enzymes, all of those things are produced in the liver. So the liver plays a really important role in ensuring that you, or your hormones are balanced, that your blood is healthy, that the cardiovascular system is not stressed, that your blood vessels are maintain their structural integrity. Um, it helps absorption of vitamins. It also help, uh, sort of acts as a reservoir of nutrients, which is why they used to tell, you know, and we still do, you know, for patients or people to eat liver. Right? Liver is really rich in nutrients. I'm not saying go eat liver, uh, but uh, because now there's some issues with livers. There's other hormones and toxins that get all concentrated in livers unless you get organic grass-fed and know the source. But it's a very nutrient-rich um, organ. So eating it actually is very similar to eating a multivitamin, if you will, full of nutrients, full of um, minerals and vitamins. All right, and then right here, um, the detoxification um, function of the liver is best broken into two phases, and this is something that I think is really important. I learned about it as a student in medicine, but I think everyone should know about this. I think we should teach this to our kids in school, that the liver has two phases, um, phase one and phase two detoxification, and they each play an important role when we're detoxifying. So I'll go into another diagram for you so you can really appreciate what that, that means. And then the, the other important role it plays is that it neutralizes free radicals. So if you've heard of oxidative stress or if you ever thought about taking antioxidants to prevent cancer or to prevent other conditions, this is the reason. It's because oxidative stress is essentially free radicals causing damage to cells and organs in our body. And it's the liver's job to make sure that doesn't happen. All right, so we're going to talk about phase one, phase two detoxification, just so you can appreciate the liver and how important its role is in um, in processing these chemicals, and then the second, looking at free radicals and oxidative stress and the role that plays in, in your health. So here's the phase one, phase two. So this is someone's liver. The liver is not green, and it's not th this color. The liver is actually a rich blood color, so a rich brown color. Um, as toxins enter the liver, they go through phase one detox, which creates intermediate metab metab metabolites. Um, those metabolites are picked up by phase two nutrients, if you will, or phase two pathways in the liver, which then um, detoxifies those toxins or neutralizes them rather, and then sends them over either to the kidney or to the gallbladder or to the stool for elimination. Everyone's following this, right? Okay. Each phase requires certain nutrients in order to function properly. So these are some of the nutrients that we know phase one and phase two require in order to function properly. Now, what's really important in this diagram is the fact that this is like a conveyor belt. If you got toxins coming into phase one, they move through to phase two and out to, to, our, to be eliminated very smoothly and it's a coordinated function. If phase one slows down, it doesn't really pose too many challenges just means everything functions a little bit more slowly. If phase two slows down, what do you think would happen in a conveyor belt if the guy downstream from you stops doing his job? Everything backs up. So everything that's phase one is prepared for phase two to pick up actually backs up. And what we get is this increase in metabolites, which then overflow into our circulation. Now what's interesting, and maybe a fault, a design fault, is that the metabolites that phase one creates are actually more toxic than the toxins that initially entered the liver. So they're much more toxic. So our system is actually designed to pick them up really quickly, 
to make sure that those, ex those very toxic or now increased toxins um, don't get into circulation and cause problems. So phase two becoming sluggish is a problem, and we see this quite often. It could, be, it could have to do with decreased kidney function. It could have to do with decreased nutrients that support phase two. It could also have to do with gallbladder not functioning well, so the bile is backing up, and it just doesn't have the capacity to receive toxins. So everything backs up, and now we get these intermediates that start to go out into the circulation. This is where we see some of the additional um, organs involved, so kidneys, skin, lungs. It's when these intermediates start to overflow that those organs kick into a higher gear. They start to work harder which is good, but long-term, those organs get burnt out. Those organs get burdened, and then we can see symptoms. We see urinary symptoms, we see kidneys um, not functioning as well, and we also see skin issues as well as hormone issues and so on. So um, now, if you wanted to treat this as an integrative doctor, you wouldn't increase phase one activity, because stimulating phase one activity would really cause everything to back up. You'd always start with this. We start with making sure that elimination is, is healthy, Everyone is eliminating well, the gallbladder is working well, the bowels are moving, the kidneys are flushing, that they're hydrated. Once we know that all the pipes are open and everything's clearing, then we go ahead and support phase two. We say, okay, let's upregulate phase two and now start picking up more of those phase one byproducts so we can process them. Once you've got phase two covered, then you can stimulate phase one and say, okay, let's just make sure now that we can do detoxification on this patient and just really process and get rid of any toxins that are in their system. And if you've heard of detoxification protocols, you hear about them in the spring usually. There's a lot of programs out there, kits that you can buy. Um, some kits will take into account this phase one, phase two, but many of them don't. So many of them will actually stimulate phase one and phase two at the same time. And they also don't account for decreased elimination. So if someone's constipated, dehydrated, has gallbladder issues, it doesn't take that into account. So what it does is it'll increase detoxification without really allowing for elimination or effective elimination. And so those can cause more issues. Maybe you've heard of things like detox symptoms associated with patients who do detoxifications. This is part of the reason why detox symptoms can develop. Patients break into rashes, they get headaches, body aches, they feel more fatigued, more malaise, and all that is because toxins are building up in the body and they're not getting rid of them fast enough. So the lesson there is don't do a home detoxification kit. Yeah, <laughs> really, that's all. All right, so why do we need liver protection? Um, the liver protection is really important because we're always exposed to stressors. There's, um, it's almost impossible to avoid exposure to toxins. I think I, I read not long ago about um, how they found toxins, specifically um, herbicides and pesticides, as far south and north um, as the Antarctica or the North Pole. When they dig in and get um, samples, ice samples, they're finding pesticides that we use in our golf courses. Um, so next time you go golfing, keep that in mind. Um, the, uh, yeah, these chemicals get into, get into our environment and they find their way through, um, through, sort of through the air and settle down. So it's impossible to avoid them. So we're not here to talk about how to avoid chemicals. What we want to do is really just identify what are some of your stressors, what are some of the chemicals that you're exposed to, and then change some of the ones we can change. So if you can de in decrease coffee intake or alcohol intake or smoking, if you can decrease the need for prescription or over-the-counter medication, then let's do that. Let's decrease the ones that we can because there's plenty that we can't, um, that we can't change or avoid. <clears throat> All right. So that's the liver, the detox organ. Remember, the liver is key or plays an important role in oxidative stress and aging. And oxidative stress is key. How many of you know what oxidative stress is? Okay, so not very many. So let me give you another diagram that'll put it all into context. That's oxidative stress, right? That's what's happening to an apple. <laughs> so you all know what oxidative stress is. Um, so this is an apple that's healthy, it's not oxidized, this is the side that's oxidized. And that's really what oxidative stress is, it's oxygen reacting with different um, molecules, if you will, and causing damage to those molecules. So oxidative stress is when oxygen particles or reactive particles are reacting with our body, with our DNA, um, sometimes with proteins, sometimes with lipids, and they cause damage to those, those molecules. 
Um, oxidative stress leads to many pathophysiological conditions. We've identified many, many, many conditions, and, all, and we're learning more and more about how oxidative stress is involved in, especially what we call degenerative disorders, things like neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, or um, degenerative disorders affecting our musculoskeletal system, things like arthritis, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, heart and blood vessel disorders, in general, what we see is oxidative stress stimulates our body's immune system, so we go more into an inflammatory state. And we're seeing that inflammation is an underlying sort of driver of a lot of diseases, more, most importantly right now, which is um, being um, sort of highlighted more and more as the relationship between inflammation and Alzheimer's, as well as inflammation and cardiovascular disease. All right, so I think, yeah, we'll go this way. And just to put it into context, what oxidative stress does, well, there it is. Free radical oxidative stress can affect every organ and every system in our body. This is essentially the imbalance between the production or the, um, yeah, the production of free radicals and our body's ability to neutralize them effectively. And when the free radicals increase and our body's ability to neutralize them decrease, what we get is these free radicals that circulate around and they start to damage organs and systems and they've been implicated in all of these conditions. And if this doesn't make you feel old if you had these conditions, <laughs> um, I don't know what would, because this is really what we talk about when we talk about unhealthy aging, is that over time you start to develop more and more organs and system dysfunctions which lead to multiple diseases. It's not just one condition. We see all these multiple conditions start to appear or just an inability to repair and overcome some of the conditions, some of the situations that come up around health. Sure. Um, so these are the organs. So I'll start right at the top, the heart. So congestive heart disease, cardiac fibrosis, hypertension, ischemia. Um, in the skin, we see definitely skin aging. So if you've ever paid attention to skin products, you know that antioxidants are an important part of skin products with the promise that they'll decrease oxidative damage to the skin. Now, they, that might help superficially in terms of protecting the superficial layers of the skin, but the real challenge with oxidation in the skin is that it's the blood vessels that are bringing too many oxidants into the area. So if you can't stop those oxidants from entering the skin, topically, you're not going to get too much, um, too much um, sort of benefits. Um, we've got kidney function that's been associated, or free radicals that's associated with kidney dysfunction. So everything from chronic kidney disease to renal graft, uh, need for renal graft and nephritis. We've got arthritic conditions down here, COPD, asthma. What you want to think about, or how you want to think about free radicals, is that anytime there's damage to tissue, which which is what free radicals cause, the repair mechanisms kick in. When repair mechanisms kick in, there's increased inflammation in that organ. So all these organs can be affected by inflammation. And the result of inflammation is multiple nutrient deficiencies because we know inflammation depletes a lot of nutrients as it's trying to manage, manage the, the damage. What we also see is that there's a lot of scarring that sets in. So the scar tissue, the repair mechanisms come in and they produce scars and that scar Scar, scars are non-functional tissue, meaning that when scar settles into any organ, it kind of fills the structural void, but it doesn't add to function. It doesn't really improve function or replace function. So you can have scar replace some lung tissue, so the structurally the lung is protected or preserved, but functionally the lung's function starts to decline because scar tissue is non-functional tissue. And so COPD would be a common finding in someone who's got chronic, repeated oxidative stress in the lungs. In the brain, we see associations with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, migraines, stroke, and cancer. So again, the, the, the point, if you will, is that wherever there's oxidative stress, there's inflammation. Wherever there's inflammation, there's repair. Wherever there's repair, there's scarring. Where there's scarring, there's decreased organ capacity. And the combination of decreased capacity, increased inflammation, just perpetuates organ and tissue damage. And that essentially is what drives aging, if you will, or just organ death. And the rest are immune system, blood vessel, and then multi-organ um, effects of free radicals, which is things such as diabetes, which is considered more of a metabolic disease, not an organ-specific disease. Um, fatigue or chronic fatigue, which is, again, not really related to any one organ. It's a general 
state, um, and so on. All right. So how to love your liver. How many of you love your liver? <laughs> yes. All right. So, so, so that's good, because um, your liver loves you back. <laughs> So it's not that hard to love the liver. Um, really, it, one is learn about it. So you just did. Hopefully, you've really come to appreciate that the liver um, plays a really important um, role in detoxification and oxidative stress. Um, and just the more you know about the liver, the more you'll be able to make choices that protect your liver or help support your liver. Um, eating foods high in antioxidants is a really easy way to support your liver. Um, if you don't know what foods are high in antioxidants, think colors. The more colorful you eat, the more antioxidants you're eating. And uh, I've got a list of antioxidant um, content of some of the common foods that we eat, just so you can see what the actual levels are and how they compare with one another. Um, you want to eat foods that promote healthy detoxification. So some of these foods are known to be um, excellent for the liver, things like turmeric. Most of you have probably heard of turmeric. Um, you can add it to food. There are also foods such as artichoke. Artichoke has a very specific affinity for the liver. It helps support and it's actually put in pills and sold for $30. But you can just go buy some and steam it. Um, it probably doesn't have the same effectiveness, but if it was part of your diet long term, you'd see benefits instead of having to go on a course of pills. Um, other foods, things like dandelion greens are bitter. They have a very strong affinity for the liver. The next time you use pesticides to kill them, think about that. <laughs> uh, make sure you're hydrated. Um, hydration is key. The liver, like anything else that you clean, is going to need some hydration. You need some fluids to flush things out. So the more hydration while you support with other foods and nutrients and herbs, the better. Ensure healthy elimination. Again, can't speak to this enough. If you're, if you're not eliminating well, your liver is constantly being auto-intoxicated, meaning that you're, it's working really hard to get rid of things, but it's having to reabsorb and refilter the same toxins that it already filtered once. And so it just continuously starts to um, uh, become, or progressively becomes more and more burdened. Minimize the need for medication, so where you don't need medication, so if there's alternatives that you can consider, if it's over-the-counter or prescription, take steps, whether it's you know, with your doctors, um, but look at options for decreasing medication and promoting wellness and promoting health through other means. Um, avoid exposure to environmental toxins, and that's the whole green philosophy that I mentioned earlier. Go green. I know it, it's, it seems like a fad, but it really isn't. Um, and a lot of companies are now sort of putting themselves behind this movement, is getting rid of chemicals to bring in some of the more healthy alternatives. And then take your supplements and herbs, uh, especially ones that are appropriate for you. Don't be like the 90% of people out there who take supplements that aren't appropriate for them. Um, because that's both a waste of money, but it can also overburden your liver more. Because remember, the liver is your organ of metabolism. Every nutrient, every vitamin that you take has to go through the liver. The liver has to process it, metabolize it, and then do something with it. So if your liver is already burdened, taking more vitamins, if it's not appropriate, if it's unnecessary, is actually going to burden it more. I'm not saying vitamins are bad. I would, that would be my, the end of my career. But, uh, uh, but inappropriate vitamins can be a burden. And many of you might have had this experience where you take vitamins, you think it's good for you, you run out and you feel better. And you're like, oh, I feel better without them. And that probably speaks to the fact that you're not processing those vitamins very well. All right, so here's some antioxidant contents in foods. Um, just to put it in perspective, there's carrots right there, even though it's colorful. It's uh, probably the least. It is the least of this, this list. And then when you go down, and here's blueberries, which we all associated with a high antioxidant food. And then when we go further down, you see pomegranate is at least four times what blueberries have in terms of antioxidant content. And then wolfberries um, are one of the richest sources of antioxidants. Right. I sell them on my website. No, just kidding. <laughs> uh, wolfberries became known a little while ago as goji berries. Did anyone hear? Yeah. It was much more exotic, goji berry, than wolfberry. Um, and I don't have a website. Yeah. Oh. 
Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. Okay. So herbal and nutritional um, supplements. So there's a lot of supplements that are out there in the market that support liver health. Um, some of the more important ones are listed here. I didn't make an exhaustive list for you. It would be too long to go over. But just a few categories, if you will. Antioxidants are an important one, as we mentioned. And glutathione is probably one of the most important antioxidants that our body needs. And I'll speak a little bit more about glutathione soon. Alpha lipoic acid is really important. Why this one is important is because it's the smallest fat-soluble antioxidant that, that, uh, that exists. And that's important because fat-soluble antioxidants can, can cross the blood-brain barrier. And they can also go into cells very easily. So as the smallest antioxidant that's fat-soluble, alpha-lipoic acid has a specific or special affinity for the brain. It protects the brain from oxidative damage. It's been implicated in things like Alzheimer's, dementia, memory or cognitive dysfunction. But it's also, um, on a cellular level, it, because it's absorbed into cells and mitochondria, it's a really important antioxidant for protecting cellular metabolism, which is what gives us a lot of energy, the mitochondria specifically. Is that a big uh, um, no, you don't have to take them all, no. Um, but it, again, this is where you know, the question of what to take always becomes a long conversation. Um, you don't have to take them all, but every person might have varying needs. So if you need antioxidants that are more geared towards kidney function because you have more of a predisposition to kidney damage or kidney failure, you want antioxidants that are water soluble that can go to the kidneys and do the job. If you want to prevent neurodegeneration because that's what's in your history or family history or that's what your genes say is your disposition is to have neurodegenerative disorders, then we want to make sure that alpha lipoic acid and glutathione are part of your, your protocol. If you want to go all out and do the Hail Mary and take everything, you can. Again, um, you know, be mindful that anything you take needs to be processed. Um, so just because it's healthy doesn't mean that your body needs it or wants it all the time. Okay, selenium and CoQ10 are especially important for cardiovascular health. Vitamin C is water soluble, it's good for everything, but um, can be good for kidney or um, blood vessels. Vitamin E is especially good for heart and also brain because it's fat soluble again, so it can cross the blood brain barrier. We've got some plant sources of antioxidants, things like green tea extract, grape, grape seed extract, or bilberry, all sources of um, antioxidants. The antioxidants are called proanthocyanins. I didn't put them up there. You don't need to know that. Just Usually they'll just say extract from green tea or bilberry or, um, or um, grape seed. Then there are specific nutrients to support phase one, phase two, and now you're experts at phase one, phase two. You know more than some doctors do now. Um, so phase one and phase two um, are extremely important. Now, if you have a need for detoxification or liver support, you always start with phase two nutrients, then you proceed to phase one nutrients, right? That'll be a quiz question. So, um, because you don't want to stimulate phase one if your phase two is sluggish, because then you're going to get more metabolites, more toxins, and more symptoms um, associated with detoxification. And some of the nutrients here, methionine, glycine, vitamin B12, they're also listed in that diagram that showed you phase one, phase two at the bottom, so you can tell which one is for which phase. And then herbal products, things like milk thistle, dandelion, turmeric, red clover, schisandra berries. These are all wonderful herbs. They all have a specific affinity for the liver. This is what they look like. And there's a bonus prize for someone who can name them all. Um, anyone? No, that's turmeric, yeah. It's the same family as ginger. Yeah, this one is uh, milk thistle. Yeah, that's the thistle. I mean, that gives it away. Um, this one should be familiar. Yeah, dandelion. Doesn't, yeah, dandelion. I was going to say it doesn't hold any grudges. We've been killing it forever, but um, it's still good for us. Well, you can take both, yeah, the whole plant. But the leaves are especially, the leaves can be, um, yeah, the leaves are especially good, but also the root. So it's really the whole plant. Yeah, the leaves they make wine with. Is it, has anyone tried dandelion wine? No? Yeah, they make wine. There's wine they make wine from the, 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 the flowers, not the leaves. Sorry, the flowers they make wine with. Um, the greens you can buy in the store and just, and, and just uh, steam them and, or fry them with some butter and lemon and mustard. That's the Italian way. 
Yeah, you can juice it. Mm -hmm. That's red clover. Red clover has an affinity for the blood. It's the liver support, but it purifies the blood. So especially good if patients have inflammation in the joints or they have skin afflictions because of the uh, toxins. The red clover helps to purify the blood and the, 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 uh, get toxins out. This one is new for, to most of you. I'll be impressed if anyone guesses this one. That's shisandra berries. Shisandra berries is from Chinese medicine. We learned about it through Eastern medicine. It's a hepatoprotective. It actually protects the liver. What we've, there's been studies done now for years that the combination of shisandra berries and milk thistle can decrease liver enzymes in patients who've got elevated liver enzymes far better than some of the medications which work short term, but long term they cause more liver damage. And so in a lot of patients with chronic liver disease, specifically hepatitis C, um, the combination of these two herbs has proven to be much more helpful and recommended by, the, by even the medical community as an, alter as an alternative and a healthy alternative to some of the antivirals that we use in hepatitis C patients. And this one is uh, chelidonium. Chelidonium is a, one of my favorite herbs when it comes to liver. It has an affinity for the gallbladder specifically. So it increases bile excretion. So it kind of stimulates your body to release bile. And the more bile you release, the more you support phase two. So essentially it's like declogging the, the detoxification pathway. So you stimulate bile. And getting rid of bile is really important. We're learning more and more. The more we stimulate bile to relieve the body, the more we can affect things like hormones, cholesterol, and also liver detoxification in general. That's uh, because cholesterol and hormones all are eliminated through bile. So if you have high cholesterol, one of the reasons may be that the gallbladder is not very effective at eliminating it. And so stimulating it is a way of getting rid of it. Again, don't go home and do this. Don't go order it on Amazon. Um, there are risks with chelidonium, uh, specifically chelidonium, also a little bit with dandelion. Um, if you're on blood thinners, you want to avoid all of these. If, uh, if you have gallstones or you've had a gallbladder attack, you want to avoid chelidonium because it can it can cause a gallbladder attack. So just be mindful that these herbs come with certain adverse effects that should be screened, or you should be screened whether or not you should take it. Something like turmeric is fairly safe, again, unless you're on, uh, on blood thinners. All right, so let's talk a little bit about glutathione. Um, this is an important antioxidant. We're learning more and more every day. What's important about this, uh, this antioxidant is that it's an amino acid, it's made in the liver, and it's involved in almost every sort of antioxidant activity in the body. It protects our blood cells, it protects our brain, it protects our, um, our major organs. We see it concentrated in organs that, that are healthy, and we see the levels drop significantly in organs that are not healthy. And what's also interesting is that um, it's subject to depletion, meaning that the more your body uses it to detoxify, so whether it's poor diet, pollution, toxins, medications, stress, trauma, infection or radiation, all of those things have been shown to significantly reduce or decrease your glutathione levels. We also see that it's directly associated with age, or, it, or not associated with, but it's depleted or the levels decrease with advanced in age. And uh, the last thing here is that there are certain genes that are involved that we're learning about. So there's genes involved in the metabolism, whether it's the synthesis of glutathione or some of the um, cofactors. And these genes can decrease a person's ability to produce or recycle glutathione. And that's really important, again, because the body really depends on this recycling of glutathione, where it neutralizes an antioxidant, and then the glutathione is reset, if you will, in the liver so that it can go back out and, and neutralize the next oxidant. And if it can't recycle itself, then you essentially start to run out of healthy glutathione. And this is just a quick graph just to give you a visual on how glutathione levels are measured with age. So at age 20, they're at their highest. And as you progress with age, they decline significantly. And then oxidative stress levels increase significantly. Now, there are tests for this. So just so you know, there's actually a lot of tests that have been developed that can check for glutathione levels in your body, but also check for oxidative stress specifically. So we can actually go in and check to see whether or not your oxidative stress is high or whether your oxidative stress is low. And whether or not your glutathione levels are high, whether or not glutathione levels are low, 
And we can also check for phase one and phase two, whether phase one is uh, slow, whether phase two is slow. So there's a lot of functional tests that I've developed over the years as functional medicine, integrative medicine has evolved, where we can actually go in and functionally check for these things before we diagnose patients with diseases. We can say, hey, you've got increased oxidative stress associated with decreased glutathione. Then we can support those patients with glutathione and see oxidative stress levels go down. Okay, that was the liver. Now. <coughs> Now I have seven minutes to talk about the gut. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll make this quick. The gut is easier. Most of you know more about the gut than you know about your liver. <clears throat> so a lot of conditions affect the gut. It's really important to be mindful of that. So we see large numbers of our population are afflicted by GI diseases. So everything from simple GERD to gallstones, celiac disease, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, which at least 15% of the population is being diagnosed with this, hemorrhoids, 75% of patients over 45, diverticulitis, which again we see with age and anal fissures, all of these speak to the health of the digestive system. And uh, the reason that's important is because a healthy digestive system is the first step to a healthy liver, which is the first step to healthy aging. If your digestive system is not healthy, then all the nutrients, toxins, all the inflammatory elements, all those things are getting absorbed and they burden the liver to have to work harder. The more the liver has to work, the more oxidants it creates, the more it's depleted of nutrients and, and that cycle is generated. A um, lot of symptoms associated with digestive symptoms or system as well as malabsorption are common. Most people experience these symptoms. I won't make you put up your hands. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but I think we all know that most of us at some point or another, whether it's for a short period of time or whether it's for extended period of time, we experience some of these symptoms. And they speak to how well we might be digesting or breaking down foods, but also absorbing and assimilating the nutrients in foods. I'm sorry? Okay. Um, so this one in particular is symptoms associated with low stomach acid, which is required to break down the food, also malabsorption. Low stomach acid malabsorption lead to nutrient deficiencies, and that's really key here. Um, and the next slide shows you some of what we've measured as far as nutrient deficiencies in the U.S. population. And you see some very common nutrients that are often depleted. As much as 50 to 90 percent of pe people are depleted in folate, which is an important nutrient for what we call methylation, which is involved in detoxification. Um, B6, up to 80% of the population is depleted in B6. And these, and these to me, are staggering, these numbers, because um, when you start to think of it, everyone is depleted in some nutrient or another. Even patients or individuals who are taking vitamins, just because they're not absorbing it. They did a study with Centrum, which was a multivitamin in Canada. I don't know if it's here. And uh, they, uh, they found that most of the Centrum that patients take actually ends up in the sewage because the tablets are so bound together so tightly that the patients who have low stomach acid, and that includes a large population of patients or individuals, they don't have enough acid or enzymes to break the capsule, the, the tablet down. So the, the tablets actually end up in the sewage system, not in your body. And I don't work for a company that's uh, a competitor. Uh, I probably shouldn't have said Centrum, just erase that from the video. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so these are some nutrients, and that just, again, speaks to our absorption. If you can't absorb, you're not going to get the nutrients. If you don't have nutrients, you can't detoxify. If you can't detoxify, you get more oxidative stress, which then we turn into that apple. <laughs> All right. Intestinal flora. Um, this is a big topic. Uh, you probably have heard of it as microbiome. It's a very hot topic. A lot of research going on right now in microbiome, uh, which is looking at the role microbiome plays in our health and longevity. There's a, um, every day we're learning more. I'm overwhelmed by it, and I'm involved in very involved in this and in this and not getting to know the research, but also in, in health. Um, the UCSD is doing a lot of the research in microbiome, and they're finding that the microbiome is both influenced by a large number of factors, everything from bad foods to food sensitivities to inflammation, emotions, stress, all the way to, um, uh, or on, and on the other side of the spectrum, the microbiome affects a lot of things. So it's influenced by a lot of things, but it also influences a lot of things. It causes inflammation, it causes toxins to get through, and a lot of how it does that 
is uh, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it does that by, by damaging the gut lining. So, right, see, I had this patient walk in the other day. <laughs> um, so, so this is simple. You got cells that line the membrane of your intestines and when those, uh, those membranes lose their integrity, different particles start to seep through. And as they seep through, you get these molecules or particles that don't belong in the blood, that get into the blood, and then now they start to cause inflammation. They, there's sometimes cross-reactivity, and this is a model for autoimmune disease that's being explored, that autoimmune diseases may be, in fact, a cross-reaction where we're absorbing new molecules that look like our own body's molecules because our gut is not able to dis discern or, or filter those out. And so that's contributing to things like chronic inflammation, autoimmunity, allergies, and so on. And I won't go a lot into microbiome other than to say that the microbiome, for those who don't know a lot about it, essentially is the gut flora. It's the bacteria that reside in our gut. There's trillions of them. There's um, probably hundreds of different species, if you will, or strains. Um, it's really complex because we look at it as being influenced but also influencing. So the challenge for us providers is to identify is the gut microbiome if, uh, unhealthy because of factors downstream or is it unhealthy because of um, poor diet? Or is it unhealthy because um, of lack of probiotics, which we, you, know, you probably hear everyone should be taking probiotics and so on. So, um, so leaky gut was what it was known as. Now we try and be a little bit more professional and we call it intestinal hyperpermeability. Um, <laughs> it sounds nicer it, or more professional. And really, it's, that's all it is. It's increased permeability in the gut. And this just kind of, I know it's probably hard to see from back of the room, but this really just talks, to, speaks to some of the influences. So stress, toxins, food particles, pathogens, drugs, infections, which cause GI inflammation. Inflammation then drives the damage that causes leaky gut, if you will, or hyperpermeability, which then causes the immune complexes to form in our blood, which then goes on to cause systemic inflammation and then eventually poor health. Anytime you see systemic inflammation, you have to think increased oxidative stress. Anytime there's inflammation, there's oxidation. And that's, that's key. All right, so how to heal the gut. So in this case, um, it's simple. You avoid unhealthy foods, decrease inflammation, improve elimination. It's starting to sound redundant, right? Yeah, so it's simple. Like at the end of the day, it really and I'll summarize it for you. There's really probably eight points. If we can all stick to these eight points, we'll, we'll see great improvements in our health, not just with respect to aging, but I think all of our health. Um, correct the microbiome, support healthy digestive function. That could be through enzymes, through bitters that stimulate digestion. It could be through diet choices or how we prepare foods. Um, using herbs and supplements to protect and heal the lining of the gut, and there's many of these, and I'll speak to some of them. And then avoiding NSAIDs when possible. So aspirin, we know aspirin. A lot of people over the age of 60, 65 are taking aspirin. Aspirin is an irritant. It's, it's, uh, it causes a lot of inflammation in the digestive system. Again, I'm not saying stop taking aspirin if you've been prescribed it by your doctor, because there's great reason to take aspirin. But if there's a way to avoid it, um, especially in unnecessary cases where you take aspirin for a headache or you take aspirin for joint pains, that would be ideal because aspirin can contribute to what we're talking about. So, okay, and I don't have nice di uh, pictures for the herbs and nutrients for the gut, but, uh, but I'll just go through this. I'll name a few just as examples. I'm happy to answer questions afterwards if you want more detail. Digestive bitters, most of you are probably familiar with bitters. Swedish bitters were popular for a long time. Bitters are essentially exactly what it's called. They're bitter. The taste bitter stimulates digestive secretions. So when we talk about bitters, it's really about creating that taste. Whether it's bitter food or whether it's bitter herbs and drops, we want to stimulate the taste buds so that in response to that stimulation, our pancreas secretes more enzymes, our stomach secretes more acid, and our gallbladder secretes more bile. And that response is key in trying to enhance or improve digestion in patients. So bitters usually are given about five minutes before meals. And that's to sort of give the heads up to the digestive system that, hey, nutrients are coming, wake up. And, uh, and so the digestive system kicks into high gear, secretes things in preparation to receive those nutrients and, and assimilate them. 
And then in cases where the digestion is really weak, so there are just isn't enough enzymes, there just isn't enough um, acid to be produced, that's when we support patients with enzymes. That's when we say, here's a helping hand, enzymes are a crutch. Um, if you can't produce it, we'll give it so that your body can still metabolize and break things down. This is especially important in, you know, in, as we age because we've shown that there's decreased secretions with age. The pancreas just can't produce enough enzymes with age, which is why we tend to move towards smaller meals, more simple meals, easy to digest foods like soups and um, overcooked vegetables. And <laughs> um, so enzymes can help that because um, they'll replace some of the enzymes that your body can't make. Anti-inflammatories, um, things like turmeric, fish oils, ginger, licorice extracts, and more. Licorice extract comes with a caution. If you have high blood pressure, if you've got any type of arrhythmias, avoid licorice, don't take it, um, because it can exacerbate those symptoms. Um, demulcents are things that soothe and coat the intestines, especially good if there's inflammation. And these are things like slippery elm. There's a Y missing. Marshmallow root, zinc, carnosine is a nutrient that's, um, that's shown to really help to rebuild the gut lining. Um, glutamine is a nutrient amino acid that's, in, uh, that's a, usually in powder or capsule form that you can take and that helps to, again, um, repair some of the gut lining that may have been damaged due to inflammation. Fiber, really important to help keep regularity, but also a binding agent. Fiber as a binding agent helps to bind bile, which um, is really important because as much as bile is good for us, bile is also an irritant. So patients who have, or people who have a lot of bile going into their intestines without enough fiber actually experience a lot more bloating, gas, irritability because bile irritates the stomach lining. And we've seen and known now that bile that's unbound to fiber can cause dysbiosis, it can cause leaky gut syndrome, it can cause inflammation and so on. Um, collagen is becoming more and more popular as a nutrient that helps to coat and help repair the gut lining, and then probiotics for microbiome support. Okay, in summary, I don't know how that reads back there, but I'll read it to you really quick. Um, so in summary, um, we talked about healthy diet. Healthy diet is really important. That includes whole food, nutrient-rich, hydration, Alkaline diet, anti-inflammatory in some cases, especially inflammation is, is, uh, plays a role, hypoglycemic, and hypocaloric. Now, hypocaloric is important. I don't suggest here that everyone should go on diets and eat less than what their body needs, but more and more research is showing that eating a calorie-restricted diet has numerous health benefits. Um, but to do this, th this, the first few is key. You can't go on a hypochloric diet that's not whole food, that's not nutrient rich, that's not um, hypoglycemic. And that's the mistake a lot of people make. They eat less, but they eat less of the wrong food. Right? So then their blood sugar is going up and down and they're, getting, they're not getting enough nutrients because the food that they're eating doesn't have sufficient nutrients to support what their body needs. So, so the key is to meet these criteria before even attempting to go on a hypochloric diet. Healthy lifestyle, active, meaningful, free of unnecessary stress, if possible. Balanced and healthy pace. Attitude is important, optimism, resilience, being forgiving. Light-spirited and living with intention can be key in sort of just keeping your stress levels low, keeping you, um, we know stress causes oxidative stress. There's a direct relationship. Um, supporting normal physiology, really important in healthy aging. We don't want to just look for disease and treat it. We want to identify normal physiology that needs support before it becomes diseased. Minimizing toxic load and oxidative stress, going green. Decreasing inflammation and promoting repair. Treating underlying conditions that promote illness. Um, using least toxic but most effective treatments. And then um, avoid unnecessary medication. Decrease stress, laugh a lot, help others. They've shown that that really relieves stress, being of service to other people. So if you can call me later. <laughs> Meditate and practice mindfulness, enjoy nature, and so on. And then get to know your genes. If you're interested, there's lots of ways to get to know how your genes might be playing into your health as you continue enjoying um, your years. And then get on a good nutritional herbal program to support your needs. That's my sort of plug, if you will. Thank you.
Thank you, doctor. And um, thank you for getting through all that very valuable information. I didn't think you were going to be able to I do it. So and either. good job. Um, we're going to take questions for about 10 minutes, and then at about 8.20, we'll finish off with the meet and greet with the doctor. So we'll start with 10 minutes of questions, and I'll let him call on you. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. I, I heard that NAC is mm -hmm. a precursor to glutathione. Yes. Is that an important thing to take? It is. So or NAC, is the question is um, that uh, whether NAC, which is also N-acetylcysteine, is a um, good thing to take because it's a precursor to glutathione, and it is. There's, there's reasons why we would choose NAC over glutathione or glutathione over NAC, and most of the reason rests with the health of the liver. So if the liver is healthy, NAC can be a good alternative to glutathione. But if the liver is not healthy, because the liver is needed to metabolize NAC and turn it into glutathione, it, uh, it's not a good choice. So it really depends on the health of the liver. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so glutathione, the precursor, you can absorb, so there's been some questions about whether or not glutathione is absorbed effectively. So by taking some of the precursors, like n acetylcysteine you absorb better, and then that gets to, the, that, that's a valid question. What's happening now is um, there's more and more forms of glutathione, like liposomal glutathione, that's, become, that's coming into the market that's much better absorbed. Liposomal? liposomal? Liposomal, which is usually bound to a fat-soluble molecule, often it's lecithin, and that actually allows it to get absorbed much better. Yes, I'll go here first. Um, methylated B vitamins. I recently yes. started taking them, but I'm, and I'm curious whether that tells me that my phase 2 is not going to be doing as well, mm -hmm. or is there some other reason why a methylated B is better so methylated B vitamins, the question is whether or not there's a reason why methylated B vitamins might be better than regular B vitamins to take. And you're speaking specifically to um, methylfolate and B12. Those are the ones that come in methylated form. And uh, those, they, what we're learning through the Genome Project, actually, is that 30% or more of the, of the population has variances in their genes which are required to metabolize um, B vitamins, specifically B12 and, and folic acid. And in, the, in that 30% population, they're unable to use the unmethylated forms. And so now a lot of companies are switching out of folic acid um, and using methylfolate instead, or, or methylcobalamin or methylhydrocobalamin, uh, because the methylated form bypasses that pathway. So you might be asked by a provider to one, you could look at, they might look at your genes. So if you've heard of the gene MTHFR, has anyone heard of that? Yeah, so that's your methylation gene. That's the one that we're checking in patients to see if, or if they have any methylation issues. And whenever um, things like homocysteine levels go up in the blood, if you've had homocysteine levels be high, which increases your risk for cardiovascular disease, there is a risk or a likelihood that the methylation pathways are compromised. And so by giving methylated products, we actually bypass that genetic defect and we see improvements in patients. So there is a really good reason to take methylated products, yes. The, the, the disclaimer there is that if you take methylated products, if you haven't all your life, you can really upregulate those detox pathways very quickly. And so some people can overmethylate as a result, and so they get symptoms. They get anxiety, they get insomnia, they might have different symptoms that they develop because of overmethylation. And that's just a reaction to suddenly upregulating or cranking up those pathways that have been dormant for so long. Yes. Uh, my question is about antioxidants uh, mm -hmm. and how long they last. If uh, you had a cup of blueberries at 8 o'clock in the morning, yes. how long before you got to fill the tank again? Yeah, <laughs> great question. So the question is how long uh, would antioxidants last once you take them? And uh, whether you know, taking a cup full of blueberries in the morning would last you all day or would you need to go back and fill your cup or tank? Um, so it's a great question. I, I don't know that I have an answer to that. I think it's good practice to include antioxidant-rich foods in your diet so you're intermittently eating um, antioxidants. I would say that um, I'm trying to think of how our tests work because we tested and we were able to measure antioxidant activity and make certain inferences from it. So 
um, and we don't tell patients to come in a certain time or so I think I think we're, you're good I think if you had blueberries in the morning you probably want to have it at lunch and again at dinner but I'm not sure it's because the levels really drop I think that um, someone so we load patients so if you load up with antioxidants and increase your reserves you're probably good you'd be resilient you can go a day without eating antioxidants and not worry about oxidative damage but if you're going into it with low reserves and low resilience, then, then you might need a little bit more. So loading up with antioxidants is a great way to make sure that you've got reserves moving forward. I'm going to go back there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, both, uh, so the question is whether or not it's healthy or good to take apple cider vinegar in the mornings with some water to support the gut. And the second question is whether kefir can be a good alternative to probiotics. And both the answer is yes. Um, you can, they, apple cider vinegar in some water is excellent for stimulating the gut. It's not good for everyone. Apple cider vinegar can be irritating. So if you've got inflammation in the stomach, so gastritis, or if you've got heartburn, chronics, where there's inflammation in the esophagus, that can really irritate the condition. So, um, so be mindful of that. But it's absolutely, it's alkalizing, yet it stimulates digestive secretion. So it's, uh, it's also becoming more and more known as a, a meta metabolic stimulant, that it stimulates digestive function and stimulates metabolism. As far as kefir goes, you only get certain strains in kefir. So for maintenance, it's probably a good idea if you do kefir, I would rotate through different suppliers just because different brands will have different um, strains of bacteria. And so if you're going to go for fermented food products, I would include different varieties in that so that you're not constantly eating only the same few strains that that company uses. But if you're looking at probiotics more therapeutically, so you have a specific condition or specific needs, then kefir wouldn't be a good alternative. You want to go straight for some of the research strains that have um, the evidence behind it and the levels you get in a therapeutic dose for treating conditions is much higher than the levels you'd get in kefir. So I have to go back there first, please. Yeah. Are you able to do one of uh, a full assessment at the integrated medicine center? I mean, where does somebody, I've never seen that yeah, no, it's, it's not very common. So the question is whether or not you can get a full assessment at the Samueli Center and uh, that this is not really common knowledge within you know, conventional medicine models of care. And, uh, and it, the answer is yes. So we do a lot of functional testing, um, sometimes driven by the need. So depending on what the person has in terms of symptoms or conditions, or if they just want to run all the tests, depends how much money you want to spend. Um, <laughs> The, there's a lot of tests. You, know, you can literally spend $5,000 on tests if you wanted to. But each test ranges from $50 to six dollars or 700 for some more specialized tests. And yes, we absolutely can. And you'd be surprised at things we can measure. It's just they haven't existed in medicine yet because the model of care wasn't there. So as we are learning more about functional medicine and the preventative medicine, integrative medicine, we're developing the tools to measure the things that we need to do our job. And so that's just, there's a lag period between the concept and the tools to support it. Um, so I, I don't know that I can, I mean, alkalinizing the body is really important. I don't have a specific opinion on alkaline water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, just a question in your thoughts on where to buy vitamins mm -hmm. I think, so the question is where to buy vitamins, and it's a great question because they're, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Every you know, company is coming up with their own brands, and now every doctor is coming up with their own brands. So, um, so I think the more informed you are of the type of vitamins you need, not just the type like vitamin A over vitamin C, but also the, the, the forms they come in. So for example, glutathione, liposomal can be much better absorbed. In, you know, there's, there's different forms that, that vitamins come in. So the more informed you are on, on what you, what's available, the better choices you can make. A lot of the companies will put out products because the demand is there, but they're not smart about the products they put out. They put it out because there's a demand. Um, but the research and the emerging, <coughs> excuse me, uh, emerging um, supplements, they really take into account absorption. They take into, you know, half-life, 
um, routes of um, administration, so how you take it. So I think it's, the question is, if you're looking to make a choice by yourself, um, then, uh, then it's a little harder. Having someone to support you and, and help you make those choices can definitely Pay, pay forward because you'll save a lot of money on supplements that your body doesn't need. So again, you know, it's uh, my my answer would be get good good support. I think that's it's a field that's exploded in the last decade or two decades, and uh, even we're having a hard time keeping up. Yeah, um, I'll go here. Yes. Uh, in terms of the, um, <coughs> Yeah. Sure. It's a really good question. So the question is whether or not um, is it enough to take the fresh herbs, so turmeric in cooking or dandelion greens, rather than the supplements. And and the answer is a little bit more complicated. Um, it's absolutely good to include foods that are good for you in your diet and for health maintenance, health promotion, overall um, wellness. That's helpful. To get to therapeutic doses, if you're addressing a condition or if you're wanting to specifically have a, an effect, a measurable effect, um, you're not going to get enough from eating dandelion greens or turmeric. There's also a question of, um, <coughs> excuse me, a question of uh, how you take it. So turmeric, for example, culturally, if you look at Indian food, they would add turmeric to oil or butter or ghee, really, and they would add the black pepper and the cardamom and the fennel, and they'll fry it up initially before they add the food to it. Um, we have people now who take a teaspoon of turmeric powder and throw it into their smoothie. Well, completely different absorption rate. You don't absorb turmeric because it's fat soluble, the curcumoids that are in the turmeric. The only way to absorb it is to cook it or steep it in oil. And the black pepper and the fennel and cardamom is what's going to increase its absorption, sometimes by 90%. So really, the Indians have got it right. Um, what you want to do is really fr fry it up before you add your food to it in some oil rather than just take the powder or the tea or any of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, go ahead. I'll do you next. Yes. Yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a range. So we do blood testing, we do urinary tests. There's a lot of urinary tests that look for metabolites. So we also do salivary tests. I'm looking at the saliva for those, that information. Some of them, it's a combination. So when we do something like Nutrival, which is a full nutritional profile that looks at our detox pathways, oxidative stress, and individual nutrients in our body, it's, a, it's, a, it's three different samples they take. And we also do stool testing for some of the microbiome tests. And okay, one last question back there. Yeah. Okay, two more. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it does matter. Glutathione is more fat soluble, so you want to take it with food or in the liposomal form. So, so if you're taking liposomal, and it says on the bottle, it takes on empty Yes, because that's liposomal. Okay. So liposomal will get absorbed because it's bound to something that gets absorbed. And in fact, you'll get more of it when it doesn't get diluted by food. But if it's not bound to, to it's not liposomal, then you're going to need the, 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 the food to be able to absorb the fat solubles better. Okay, last question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the question is uh, the, the how we take supplements. So some the question whether or not taking supplements for a period and then taking a break is of any value. And the answer is absolutely. We we recommend not only taking it for a short period but then stopping. Um, but but also rotating supplements, not to take everything all the time. The body doesn't like taking supplements all the time constantly because it gets used to it. And you don't really want your body to get used to it. So we often, or at least I often would say, uh, rotate supplements. So make sure that, you know, maybe for a few months you're taking certain supplements and then you take a break, then you start a new set of supplements. And ideally you, you tie that to certain goals. So you say, okay, we're gonna do liver support liver detox and elimination for the next three months. And once we achieve that, then we'll move on to do something else. Um, so by rotating supplements, what you're doing is you're preventing your body from becoming habituated. 
to those, um, those nutrients or supplements that you're providing it. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.